This is one of the things I do. I'm director of policy at a thing called the Tax Incentivised Savings Association, but I also study pensions in other countries um, internationally, and I consult uh, with pension companies internationally, and, and really I work in savings policy, trying to help government uh, and help other people think about the way uh, that we need to design savings structures and savings policy in such a way that people will engage with it as opposed to walking rapidly in the opposite direction. And the, the title of the talk tonight is clearly Financing Retirement History and the Policy Agenda. Well, yeah, I mean, no, what you see is not necessarily what you get. So we'll be, we'll be cantering through a few areas which are not necessarily all about um, financing retirement. And I'll be talking principally from a UK perspective, but thinking very much also about what's happening um, internationally and the places that have been successes in terms of tackling the um, retirement funding conundrum, uh, perhaps actually rather better than we in the UK uh, are doing right now, today, or will do in the future unless we change. So the, the things we're looking at, where we are today, um, short history of retirement, how we got to where we are in terms of thinking about retirement. Look a, around internationally and see what's going on. But we'll be taking a big focus on life expectancy and healthy ageing um, because this, this is, I think, the elephant in the room uh, it, when we think about retirement. Some of the implications of that, policy responses and, and some sort of appreciation of really what we've got to expect as a nation, as a people, as individuals going forward into retirement. And I'm right in that zone. You know, I'm, I'm 56 this year. So I'm a baby boomer. Um, I've got all sorts of things that have happened to me in my life which have happened to the post-war generation. So for, for me and for um, my parents who are starting to need long-term care, this is a right now issue. Yeah, it's right now that I'm heading to retirement. It's right now that my parents are starting to need care. So very, very much a live and personal thing um, for me. But first, we will have a story. And that story will be about steam engines and a watch. This is the watch. And those are the steam engines. What you see there are two unrebuilt uh, Southern Railway steam locomotives built in the 1940s. The front one is a West Country class Pacific called Bude, and the back one is 642 Squadron, an unrebuilt Battle of Britain class Pacific. And the line they are going up is a line called the Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway. I live in Bath, and if you were to sort of look to the right of this wonderfully named viaduct, which is called Watery Bottom Viaduct. I walk the dogs underneath it when I'm back in Bath. If you go sort of 200 yards to your right, that is where I now live. I'm in London most of the time, but that's, that's home. And this photograph was taken on the 5th of March, 1966, and was a special train the day before the line shut forever. And you can see the engines are working quite hard. And the reason for that is it's a 1 in 50 upgrade. So they're climbing quite hard and having to labour uh, quite hard. And that climb was 1 in 50 out of Bath through a couple of tunnels. It's about to go into another one called Coombe Down Tunnel. And the reason I've got that picture up there is because of this watch. And this watch says on the back, British Railways, London Midland Region, J. Johnson, in appreciation of 45 years' service. And it was given to one James Johnson, because I've traced him and his records, in 1961, who was listed as a banking engine driver at Bath Green Park Shed, Green Park Shed being the home shed for the Somerset and Dorset uh, Joint Railway. Banking engines pushed goods trains up steep inclines. And so the chances are that James Johnson, wearing this watch maybe, drove his engine past where I now live between 1961 and 1966. Why 1966? Because the day after this line shut, he is listed as retiring. 7th of March 1966, James Johnson retired after a 50-year period of service on the railways. 
He joined the Midland Railway, with which this line was associated, at Carlisle Canal Shed in 1916. Now, why do I cite all this? The first thing is to point out the change in working patterns. Back then, you would expect to work for an employer either for your entire working life or for a large part of it. And James Johnson would have joined the railways and would have been pleased to join the railways, A, because it was a reserved occupation and he didn't have to go to the, uh, the trenches. But he would have been delighted to join the railways for two reasons. First of all, it was very secure employment, or was regarded as such. There were layoffs in the 1920s, but not too many. And the second reason he would have been delighted to join the railways was they were early adopters of pensions. The railway companies were the first into providing pensions for the bulk of their employees. And a pension in 1916 would have been something to treasure. Because if you did not have a pension from your employer, then you were looking at a means-tested retirement pension payable from 70. And the means testing was severe. It was not a joke. They would send people round, and if they went into your house and thought you had a dining room table that was too posh for the house, you had to sell it. It was, it was just dreadful. So a job that had security and a pension was something to treasure. And even within my working lifetime, I can remember uh, jobs like that. When I joined uh, the financial services industry in 1980, I was taken to one side by the branch secretary of Norwich Union's Newcastle branch, and I was told that I was a very lucky young man. If I worked hard and kept my nose clean and did what I was told, I would have a job for life. The society would look after me, my family, and my children into retirement and beyond. It was a patrician deal but that patrician deal has gone and we've got some problems. So let's take a look at the current pension landscape in the, in the UK. If we look at where we are now, when I say you are here, that means actually I am there. And we've just seen a bow wave go through of people who have retired on very good defined benefit pensions. That is where a promise is made in relation to your final salary usually that you get a fixed percentage of that as a guaranteed income when you retire. The problem is that those pensions, which is what James Johnson would have enjoyed, he lived incidentally just two years in retirement. He died aged 68, two years after he, he re, uh, three years after he retired. Sorry, he died in 1968, so he died aged 67. And that's, that's another point to bring out, that actually in those days, um, blue-collar workers did not live very long, either before retirement or after, and I'll, I'll kind of come back to that. But right now, I am here. I've got a defined contribution pension. In other words, a certain amount of money is paid into it each year. It grows up in accordance with whatever investment return we can get and then I have to buy an annuity to turn it into pension income. And the outcomes from those schemes, it has to be said, are not as good. But I'm lucky compared with what's coming behind me. I've got group personal pension plans there for general Generation X. They're like uh, individual pension pots uh, that your employer happens to pay into, but they're, they're owned by you. And they're basically the, the architecture that we're seeing out there in, in occupational pensions today. And the problem is that nowhere near enough people are paying into a pension and nowhere near enough people are paying enough into a pension. And so we've got this huge pension gap looming where people will retire on incomes that are really totally inadequate or, or maybe they won't retire. And, and this is something that we'll, we'll consider as we go down the track. But the forward outlook for generations X and Y is not good. I have a pension fund which is probably 10 times um, the average pension fund in the UK. The average pension pot last year was somewhere around £27,500, which will buy you about £1,800 a year of income. This is pitifully poor, but even on the pension I've got, I will not generate enough income to retire on that pension fund alone. My options are limited. So, have a nice day. 
Okay, short history of retirement. We've got to remember that actually the idea of retirement is relatively recent. It could be argued that given what I said earlier about a, a 70, an age 70 retirement age, that actually the, the idea of, of a comfortable and, and possibly a number of years retirement is a post-war idea. It's post-war. It's really the second half of the 20th century that it became, um, it became something that people culturally looked forward to. And this was really delivered through the beverage report which set out the welfare state idea for after the war. This is a time, remember, when Britain and Europe were industrial powerhouses. They made steel, they mined coal, they built ships, they did all sorts of things um, that we don't seem to do today. So we had the economic base to make a range of promises about pension, about welfare state, that maybe, just maybe, going forward, we're going to find very hard to sustain. And when we look around the world, at the developed world, we see typically a two or three tier pension system. And that will typically be state, pillar one, a central core pension provision, maybe not very generous, um, but, you know, a, a sort of staple, pillar one. Pillar two might be a supplementary state scheme, or it might be compulsory private saving. And s pillar three is voluntary private saving. So as we look around the developed world, we see typically those sort of things in terms of retirement funding architectures. State systems in Europe are typically social insurance, which subtle, s differs subtly from the national insurance contributory, notional contributory based system that we've got in the UK. But in fact, both are, to some extent at least, pay as you go. In other words, the contributions made today go to pay the pensions of the people who are retired right now. We call those pay as you go or pay go systems. And the question mark emerging uh, as the uh, developed world ceases to be the economic powerhouse it once was. Are these sustainable? Now, you have in your, your seats a paper by my esteemed and very learned friend, Con Keating, who's an intellectual um, far beyond my, my own standing, who would argue that, yes, they are sustainable. But I think the jury is at least out on whether that is, is possible or not. If we look around the world, state retirement benefit systems are under pressure and I've put in where they exist at all, because I've been studying the emerging world. If we think about India, we think about China. If we think of China as an economic powerhouse, I've, I've been looking at what they're doing, and they've basically taken a look at the Western model of um, pay-as-you-go pensions and walked rapidly in the other direction. India, for example, has a state pension, but it is so pitiful that it's economically impossible to even think about living on it. It's, it's absolutely minuscule. And they are quite clear that they are going to do no more than that. They are also reasonably clear that they're going to um, provide some kind of architecture which people can put into uh, nationally, but they're kind of working on it. Um, so state retirement benefit systems are under pressure. What do we mean by that? In the UK, we spend 5.1% of GDP on all state retirement benefits. That makes us the cheapest in the EU 25. France spends 12.5% of GDP on state retirement benefits. Germany spends 16.5% of GDP. This is not sustainable. It's arguable that it's sustainable at 5.1%, but there are at least some uh, global commentators such as the IMF who would argue that the pension and healthcare promises made forward by the UK government to its population effectively make the UK bankrupt today. Now, I don't know whether they're right. I think they probably are. And certainly there are arguments both ways. But, you know, this is a big, big, big problem. I put in there entitlement versus means-tested benefits. When Beveridge reported, he was reporting against a background of means-tested age pension, which was largely considered to be undignified. And so he put in place a pension as of entitlement 
that you had paid for with contributions, national insurance contributions. Ironic then that in the late 90s we moved away from that welfare state principle of entitlement back towards means tested benefits such as pension credit and guarantee credit. Private saving varies widely across the, the planet. In France until recently private saving for a pension, certainly company employer based um, saving for a pension was a rare event. But Filon reforms in 2003 have put in place architectures which mean that increasingly um, company and individual pension saving and certainly employer-based pension saving uh, are taking off. And they need to take off because you cannot carry on spending 12.5% of GDP in France on retirement benefits. They know that. They're trying to push the reforms through. But it is a bit like turkeys. I'm a turkey voting for Christmas. So workplace pension schemes are on the march in, the, in Europe, but the irony is that they're in decline in the UK. In 1967 in the UK, we had 12 million people enrolled in mostly defined benefit pension schemes out of a total workforce at that point of 16 million. In other words, three quarters of the workforce were saving into a good pension or having a pension provided for them. That figure today is 45%. Employers tell me, and I work with the Institute of Directors and advise them, and I hear from employers that they no longer see it as their role to provide a pension because their employees no longer demand it. Ironic, isn't it? We were once the best, 10 years ago, we were the best pension nation on the planet. Now the best pension nation per capita is Australia. So occupational schemes are shrinking. At this rate of decline, Occupational pension schemes, as we currently understand them, will have ceased to exist in seven years' time. Now, that's not going to happen, of course. There'll be a long tail. And by occupational schemes, I mean trust-based pension schemes. There are other types of pension. Most worrying thing is there are at least 4.7 million people who are eligible to join a pension scheme and receive an employer contribution who are not doing so. And 10 million at least, are not saving into any kind of pension at all. There has been a structural switch to group personal pension plans. They are contract-based plans. They require a lot less administration by the employer. And they have been a success story with 6.7 billion per annum going into them. The other success story has been an architecture called self-invested personal pensions, where you control the investment content of your pension, and that's, that's really taken off. Interestingly, in individual savings accounts, which have been the savings success of the last 20 years, we now have 350 billion of assets in individual savings accounts, and this is saving for retirement. How do we know this? Because 80% of equity ISA money sticks for 10 years or more, and 65%, believe it or not, of cash ISA money sticks for 10 years or more. People are already using ISAs. As, sa as retirement savings vehicles because they're simple and they understand them. Pensions are incredibly complex and, they, and people don't understand them. And look at that, it's going to overtake the 400 billion that there is in occupational defined contribution pension uh, plans pretty soon. So the pensions market is moving, it's, it's in flux. Why is the second reason why pensions are important are around longevity and healthy aging. Because if you have a pot of X and you want to draw an income from that pot over Y years, clearly the lower the number that Y is, the bigger annual income you can expect. And this may also contribute to some of the issues that you're likely to experience in later life. So I'm going to spend some time um, really looking at um, longevity now because longevity and the increases therein are at the core of some of the issues that we are going to uh, face in retirement. Now this is from the Office of National Statistics and it's a projected um, increase in life expectancy for males and females. Um, I'm just going to come straight out and I think this, say this figure, is, this projection is rubbish. If you look at where we are now at 2011, 
particularly from males, we are seeing a, a really quite steep rate of increase, which ONS, for some reason, thinks is going to decrease and then level out. Why? This, this projection is not credible. Every longevity projection there has been over the last 20 years has been beaten. All the actuaries who are responsible for calculating this stuff set out projections um, for life expectancy and they are continually beaten. Interestingly, when I first came into financial services, one of my first jobs was writing out quotations for pension schemes. And I, we used an ADO machine, you remember those? Well, some of you will remember those, but others won't. Uh, calculators hadn't arrived yet. And we used um, life, longevity tables, life expectancy tables, to, to do the calculations for these insured defined benefit schemes. And I noticed at the top that it said something like LA10-49. And I, this was 1980. And I, I went over to my supervisor and I said, um, these tables, are, are they from 1949? Oh, yeah, that's the last time we, we did these tables. And of, of course, it was just you know, absolutely crazy. And these people are supposed to be actuaries. Uh, in fact, things have got a lot better now in that they have a, a continuous mortality study which is done on a rolling basis and actually seems to be at least keeping up with the pace. But I put this up there because really I just don't believe that. And here's why. Average male life expectancy, that's a misprint. It's now 82. In 1948 it was 66. In 1948 male retirement age was set at 65 when the state, the state pension as we currently see it came in. That's a one-year differential. So right now, today, if we just assume that that uh, 80 figure is correct, if we were to preserve that one-year differential between the state retirement age and average male life expectancy, then the state male retirement age right now, today, should be 79. If you get to 65 today, you have at least 17 years life expectancy in front of you. If you're a female age 65, you have 20 years of life expectancy in front of you. But healthy life expectancy is just 13 years and 15 years respectively. And this points up the scale of the problem with long-term care that is coming towards us. Worse, life expectancy varies by social class and location. Male life expectancy in some areas of inner city Glasgow is barely 65. Life expectancy itself and healthy life expectancy are separate issues. But they are issues which are both associated with retirement and they both throw up their own funding conundrums. Where's it going? Male 65 cohort life expectancy is forecast to be 25 years by 2051. I think it will be more than that. My own father uh, retired from the civil service age 63. He is 93 today and is experiencing increasing health problems such that he will probably shortly need uh, residential support and care. Females, 28 years. The age 80 population will grow from 2.8 million in 2008 to 5.8 million in 2033 and 10.6 million in 2083. One in three girls born today can expect to live to over 100, and one in four boys. Male and female life expectancy is converging. The thing that used to kill men was not actually um, smoking. Well, it does kill you, but I'll come to that in a moment. I speak as a smoker. The thing which used to kill men in their 50s was um, arterial blockage. And what, what that's about is narrowing of the arteries, usually associated with cholesterol. So as a man in my late 50s, I'd be peddling down the street one day, and finally that artery that had been thickening up would get a clot in it, and I'd go, and I'd go over, and if I hit the deck quite hard, it might actually unblock it. So, if I survive, I'm carted into hospital where I'm laid on a bed, and because they didn't know the difference between different kinds of heart attacks, 
they, they did some fairly standard drips, which of course did nothing for a, an arterial blockage, and they really didn't have the scanning equipment. And this is as recently as the early 1980s. And of course, I'm lying down, and the blockage comes around again, and bang, this time I'm gone. But, you know, I, I could be gone. Statins have just revolutionized male life expectancy. They have changed the landscape completely. Now you go and you get a cholesterol test, um, and you get a, you know, all the usual sort of tests and blood tests and whatever. And if you're at risk, you just put on statins. And it, that thing alone is, is just extending male life expectancy exponentially. As a smoker, uh, my li where am I today? So yeah, I've got a, I've got a 20% greater chance right now today of getting lung cancer than a non-smoker. But a non-smoker in my cohort, it's only about you know 0.1% chance of getting um, getting lung cancer. Where it really kicks in as a killer for smokers is into the 80s. And it kicks in not only as a lung cancer, but a range of other cancers. I'll come back to why that actually might be quite important um, down the track. I suppose I'm managing my own risk here, but the one thing I don't want to be is in the nursing home. Anyway, uh, to finish this slide off, number of people over state pension age will increase 32% by 2033, and yet the number of under 16s is only going to increase by 10%. Who's going to pay the pensions of these people and who's going to pay for our long-term care? It's a pretty hefty um, equation. There you go. Male life expectancy, according to a recently re released report by the Department for Work and Pensions, who clearly don't talk to the Ash Office of National Statistics, suggests that male life expectancy increased by 44 days, that is well over a month, in the last year alone. That's the pace of increase in longevity. And nearly a million people over state retirement age today will live to be 100. Currently there are 12,400 centenarians. So that's from 12,400 to nearly a million within the life expectancy of the current retiree cohort. In 2081, according to the same estimates, there will be 22,000 adults aged 110 or over. Harry Patch, the last veteran of the trenches in the First World War, died aged 110. Imagine 22,000 Harry Patches living up to 120. And as I said earlier, nearly 30% of today's children will live to be 100. But it gets worse. This guy is a guy called Aubrey de Grey. Um, I've had him along to talk at one of the things that I, that I organise, and I remember the, the whole room falling silent as he walked in, because, you know, everybody's in the room and they're dressed in chalk stripes like me, and they're, they're business people. And, and this guy was like something out of um, the 1970s. Do you, do, who was that guy uh, in the... He, he just looked just totally, totally hippie. Loon pants, slouch bag, the whole bit. Huge beard, huge long hair, um, and what he does is he runs a global research foundation called the Methuselah Foundation. He's based in Cambridge, but there is a global network of these people doing research. And they're doing research into the triggers of aging in cell biology. Now, I'm not a scientist, so forgive me if I get this wrong, but they believe that there are elements of the DNA which are programmed within a cell to trigger aging. They think there are five of these triggers to aging in cell biology. They believe they know where all these five are. They have found and learned how to turn off, they, they are sure, three. They're very close to turning off the fourth, they think, and they're working on the fifth. I get his newsletters. And um, recently featured in the newsletters, was, he's got a... The Americans fund this hugely, by the way, because they all want to live forever. Um, but what they've, they've got is um, a colony of mice in uh, Sacramento, California. And this colony of mice are breeding away quite happily. They have injected these mice with their early formulations of what they think could turn off the triggers to aging in cell biology. These mice are five... Mice normally only live till two. So there is this colony of five-year-old mice in Sacramento. And 
The reason that's interesting is because mice, in terms of cell biology, are apparently the closest thing um, to us. It, you know, they're, they're closer than chimpanzees, apparently. So kind of what works for mice might well work for us. So let's assume he's not mad. A lot of people think he is. Um, let's assume that he's on to something, and let's assume that, um, as he once said, the first person to live to a thousand is already alive. Who'd want to take a bet on where longevity assumptions go now? And who'd want to take a bet on all those insurance companies who have, um, have made it their business, and quite rightly so, to provide annuities um, to many pensioners in the UK? I've always said that we've never seen an insurance company actually go down in the UK, although it's at least arguable that equitable life um, sort of went down, but kind of didn't. But if we do see an insurance company go down, it will be an insurance company that provides annuities, and it will be because they have got either their life expectancy assumptions wrong, because basically when you give them money, they are taking a punt on how long you live, and if you live too long, they start losing serious amounts of money. But imagine Aubrey de Grey is even halfway right, and suddenly we go from a life expectancy of 90-ish today um, to a life expectancy of 150, 200, 300, 500, 1,000. Now, the way his stuff work, would work, he proposes, is that I would get an injection, age 56, of whatever it is he, he has, and my biological age would go back about 20 years. And as they get better at this, they'll, 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 they'll knock that back even further. So I would, I would physically look a bit younger than I do now, but internally I would be 30. And... Okay, you'd, you'd play catch-up with that, but then you'd get another injection and then, you know, you, you, it goes back. And you just keep doing that. And this throws up all sorts of, of weird conundrums. I mean, what do we do with a thousand-year-old people who are fit and active? You know, they're, they're playing squash. Um, they're, they're out working. They're riding motorbikes. They're, you know, where do we need children in all this? Or, oh, crikey, we maybe need children even more. But the, the whole point about this is that everything that we assume today could go seriously wrong. And it could go seriously wrong the other way too. We could get a catastrophic um, pandemic which just radically shortens life expectancy. Don't, so don't think I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's got to be a one-way bet. As we all live longer, um, we are running into a problem. And that problem is long-term care. One in two men and two in three women, according to recent estimates will need some kind of form of, of high dependency care uh, before they die. So long-term care for me is the elephant in the room. It's right here and now with me uh, right as we speak. Uh, my mother is in hospital um, suffering with end-stage uh, pancreatic cancer and my father is going to need uh, care very soon as well. That will need to be paid for. It will need to be paid for either from their estate, which is, is pretty much where it's going to have to come from, or it's going to be paid for by taxes. It's difficult to get an estimate, but the central case for the long-term care bill from the Exchequer last year was about 16.5 billion. That was a 20% increase on the year before. It is increasing by 20% per annum compound. It used to be the case that smokers paid for the long-term care bill. The smoking um, tax bill last year was, I believe, 9.5 billion, decreasing by 5% per annum compound as smokers either died or gave up. The thing is, from a logical point of view, if you go to a care home, and my dear Aunt Marion spent four years in a, a care home, what you will find mostly in there right now today are women, non-smokers. Okay? So... Right now, today, what the government should be doing, from a logical perspective, is encouraging everybody to smoke, but especially women. Okay? Now, I probably won't make hugely old bones. My central case, based on analysis of my um, genealogy, my internal structure, name, what I know of my parents, and so on, I think I'm probably going to live to 87 and, and then probably die of something then. I think I know what it is, but I'm, I'm not going to bore you with that. 
But the, um, the issue is I will not spend time in care, touch wood. Have you ever been to a care home? It's not a place you want to be. Um, so, what we've got to recognise is that public and private pension systems as we see them today cannot support a 30-year retirement from an effective 35-year working life. And when I say effective, that's because you've got to pay off student loans, you've got to save for a car, you've got to save for a house, and, and so on. The systems we have today, whether public or private, were simply not designed to do this. So we need to rethink retirement. Policy responses. We need to raise the state pension age. And, by the way, we need to raise it to 70 for a starter. Not, not sort of kind of 66 in a few years' time. You know, listen, the complaints we're getting now about women's pensions, I, I absolutely hear them. But 66 in 2020 is just a starter for 10. And 68 in 2048, which is the current proposal, is just too little too late. Employer attitudes need to change. They need to think about how they support and engage with older employees. The biggest increase in any employee category last year was employees over state retirement age. State retirement benefit systems need reform. And they are getting reformed. And they are getting reformed to a decent flat rate universal pension which provides a real incentive to save. But beyond that, you, you go save. Because if you want more than 140 quid a week, it's up to you. Real incentive to save. And people are going to use a mix of retirement funding solutions from employer-based pensions through housing equity, um, through continuing to work. There's going to be a mix, of, a blend of, of, of tools that people use to solve the retirement income conundrum. The government has set out that it's going to try and fill that um, retirement funding gap that we saw in the pension tsunami in the first slide by auto-enrolling employees into pension saving. And they're going to put in 8% of banned earnings between about 7,500 and 33,500 at current values a year. I don't think this is enough, and I think because of the personal debt problems we've got in the UK, that we'll, there will be quite a high level of opt-out. And it's flat rate for future state pensions, and that's great, probably from 2020. But what about today's pensioners? They're going to be left on a mix of a pitiful um, state retirement pension and means testing which means that we carry on um, clarting around in, in that, old, uh, that old area. And what can we do to make pension saving attractive again? I mentioned Equitable Life. Then there was Maxwell Group. Then there was the other one. Then, you know, it's just endless, the number of, of pension um, scandals we've had over the past 10 years. And the whole pension brand has become tarnished. You know, if, if I, if I, I'm amazed there's so many of you here to talk about pensions tonight, because if I go out and talk about pensions, you know, if I go into a pub and say, well, I work in pensions, you can just see people switching off. I mean, it's just, oh, no, you know, it's, it's, it's just like, oh, it's awful. Um, and, of course, we've got abolition of the default retirement age, which means that people can carry on um, working into later life. And any argument against that is like arguing against, it's Canute standing against the waves. Okay, some conclusions. We're going to wrap up now. Um, employers have been moving away from the provision of pensions for now. They will have to re-engage um, with pensions in auto-enrolment starting in 2012 as millions of people will get herded into pension saving for the first time. However, they are interested in other reward structures. I mentioned earlier on the success of individual savings accounts. Employers are now offering those as a core um, working benefit into which they, they just pay your salary automatically so you don't see it, it just get, gets hived off. These are proving incredibly popular um, and that's really good news. Long-term care, how are we going to pay for this? We've got a third commission looking at this, the Dilnot Commission, which is due to report shortly and I suspect will say unfortunately we're going to have to carry on paying for this from um, residential housing equity and estates. We cannot expect the state to carry on making the huge contributions it already is. Auto enrolment I believe to be a weak policy. Um, Australia has done extremely well and Australia has done extremely well in pensions by compelling employers to uh, make contributions on behalf of their employees. Next year, employers will be compelled to put 12% of total salary 
into their employees' superannuation plan, and employees are heavily incentivised to contribute on top of that. They will contribute an ag aggregate 16.5% average um, of salary next year, and this is making them the best pensioned uh, nation on the planet per capita by some long chalk. So I think auto-enrolment, this sort of semi-voluntarist approach, really isn't going to work. I think it will, it will need to be made compulsory, and I expect that to happen from 2017. How much longer for tax relief on pensions? If you've got a decent flat rate pension, but nothing beyond that, uh, that's a very clear incentive to save. If it's a very clear incentive to save, why are we giving all this money away to people who can already afford to save? Uh, it makes no sense to me. However, it's not all doom and gloom. We're all living longer, healthier, uh, more active lives than ever before, um, which is, is um, held testament to by some of the, uh, the gr grey heads in this room, and I count myself among them. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of good things, but we are going to have to work longer, get over the idea that we can fund a 30-year retirement out of a 35-year working life. We should stop lying to ourselves. We're going to have to st raise state retirement age so that we can pay some kind of state pension, a better state pension, um, to those who get there. And I would say we're also going to have to rethink how we do um, pension today because I think the brand has become so tarnished that people would rather um, walk on glass than, than save into a pension where they have a choice. We do need to rethink retirement. Thank you very much indeed. We've got time for some questions, if you like. Yes, and then uh, take you there and then up, up at the back. If you could just say who you are and if you've come from anywhere, where you've come from. My name is Lian Kamari. I'm a Corbyn Channel Audit Commerzbank. I'm here on a short audit in London. So oh, very well. tomorrow is my last day. And I took the opportunity, as I'm about your age, to uh, attend this uh, discussion. I have a question. In Germany, we have the long discussion of working longer than 63 or 65 years of age. As you might know, it has been implemented with 67. However, our experience is, and my personal experience as well, if you are older than 40, you might be 41 or 42, starting that age, it's tough to find a job. How would you consider the situation in Britain for aging population being committed to work longer? What are their chances to even find a job? That's, that's an extremely good question um, and, and very, very relevant. There is age discrimination in the UK, no question about that. If you're over 50, it can be really quite hard to find a job. However, there are a couple of things which will change that, I don't think in the short term, but over time. First of all is the abolition of the default retirement age. So if you're in a job, if you're in a job, you can carry on working as of right. The second thing that's happening is that the number of younger people, as we saw in one of the slides, is declining. And when I talk to employers, they tell me that there is a skills shortage out there. And they tell me, and this is genuinely the case, that they are actively recruiting older workers because the youngsters simply don't have the skill sets that they need. Now, this is a turning ship. It will not turn overnight, but I am absolutely sure it is turning. And certainly I would feel, uh, there's a, a third aspect to this, which is that older people can use their existing skill sets in different ways. They have a skill set to use. And I was made redundant age 51, and I went out into business on my own. And I remain an entrepreneur in financial services. I've, I'm involved with startups. Um, I'm a director of, of companies that are just getting going. So I'm, I'm doing all that stuff as well as doing this. I'm working harder now than I've ever worked in my entire life. I'm earning better now than I've ever worked in my entire life. So we can have grounds for optimism. I know I absolutely agree with what you're saying, but I think the ship is turning because it has to. At the, at the back there. Thanks. Patrick Gannan, retired merchant seaman. Assuming your figures are correct, 
and we've got all these elderly people like myself working away. Could you tell me what's going to happen to the school leavers and the yeah. university graduates? Yeah. And I believe there's about a million unemployed uh, sort of 18s to 24s now. Yeah. How does the, um, there's a million unemployed 18 to 24s now because we're going through, through a recession. But it's, it's interesting that the, you know, lots of people have said, oh, you know, the youngsters won't be able to get a job. In fact, this, this has been proved to be a myth. The same thing was said in the, the 60s when women started coming into the workforce in volume for the first time. And in fact, when we're in periods of full employment, both men, women and immigrants all have plenty of work to do. Yes, I completely agree. When was the last time that occurred in this country? Uh, well, uh, mid-late 90s. We were looking at pretty... Full employment. You still had about 2 million unemployed then. Yeah, and we've also got... I, I spent some... to the 60s to get those figures. Yeah, I, th I think you're probably right, but that's an employment policy issue rather than, you know... How can you separate the two? Okay, I mean, it depends what we want to... If, you've got, if you haven't got people employed... Okay, I, I spent some time yesterday with um, some people from the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. And one of the guys there talking, I, spent, I started my career in the northeast of England. And one of the guys there talking uh, said that in 1955 there were 500,000 people working on shipbuilding in the northeast alone. There were 400,000 people in the pits and 350,000 people in steel and chemicals. Now, in the northeast, 72% of employment is public sector. So your point is perfectly valid. But it's, it's, it's a question, that's an employment policy thing. How are we going to get volume employment back into the UK? How are we going to find volume employment for people up there? It's kind of fine for us down here. You know, we do financial services and we wander around chalk striped suits. But you're, you're quite, I do agree with what you're saying, but act, it's actually not a problem having older people work longer will not in and of itself deny younger people jobs assuming there is reasonably full employment but in somewhere like the North East the, the problems are, are just huge and endemic but the parts of London where it's endemic as well I, I dare say sir over there and then, then you hello uh, my name is Ian Burns, uh, independent financial advisor, for my sins. Um, <clears throat> it, it's interesting you were talking about annuity companies because I'm, the last week or so I've been involved in uh, what, what we call enhanced annuities where companies yeah. are actually competing uh, to actually provide better annuities for people with uh, existing problems. And it just occurred to me that it's a very competitive market and some of the companies in that market are actually quite new. And I'm really thinking, well, is this really good advice? Because it, I'm not even sure if these companies are going to be around. Um, and you may know the companies I'm talking about. Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested, you know, you don't have to commit yourself on that one, but, you know, it would just be interesting to know your thoughts on that. Um, the other quick one is um, inheritance tax. Uh, I, there's got to be a sea change on, uh, on, on people's opinion on that because the, the younger generation cannot afford to be able to pay for all the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the various geriatrics that are around. Um, and I've, of, I've often thought the, the solution really is to turn uh, inheritance tax into a kind of long-term care tax. I know the Treasury doesn't like that sort of thing, but it strikes me that that sort of t targeted tax where the older people are actually aware of where the money's going and it's going for their benefit, and inheritance tax would actually become a lot more popular and particularly if you gave it a, a, a different name, like, say, long-term care tax or something like that, and it would enable, um, you know, the benefit, sorry, the, the burden of long-term care to be spread instead of, you know, one person, for instance, losing their entire inheritance. Yeah, I mean, dealing, dealing with the first point first, I mean, to some extent it's kind of no comment because at the end of the day the FSA regulates these entities um, and you know, requires them to put capital behind what they're doing. That having been said, if I, if I stand back and if I were thinking about this um, in the round, I would probably want to see a company that's not monoline. 
Um, let's not forget that um, we've already seen some of the buyout providers who were monoline, who were effectively in EOT providers, kind of forced out of the market, Paternoster being an example. So I, I wouldn't say absolutely no, but I mean, clearly as an IFA, you would, you would tread with care and it's right that you should think about these things. As regards to the second point, I can see where you're going with that, but in a way, um, the the funding for care will tend to come out of the estate of the person who's, who's funding it. So, in a way, the government's losing out on tax because instead of collecting inheritance tax from somebody who's just kind of dropped dead, they're actually collecting a net position which might well be below the, the IHT threshold. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's an, interest, it's an interesting thought. I think the Dilnot Commission will come out with some, some proposals not a million miles away from uh, what you're talking about, actually, from, from my understanding of the work we've been doing. So, yeah, interesting thought. Uh, this lady here. Um, we'll take... We'll take this very quickly and then you and then we'll... Yeah, we'll I'll try and be quick okay. then. Hilsa Prowse, Unemployed Engineering Manager. I'm glad you've mentioned sort of raising the retirement age. I don't see why anybody should stop work at all. It's miserable being unemployed. And also, women over 50 are unlikely to get pregnant. But um, the way to, uh, one way, some ways forward are, is for state to have a, pe a notional pension at 70, which and continue to increase it for every year of deferral. Um, but the difference between actually having a, a retirement and claiming a benefit. And um, for my history reading, uh, the Chinese invented retirement for the mandarins. I believe it's before they had uh, worked out how to make reading glasses and their script is not all that easy. Hmm. But rather than have means testing, or the basic one, is to pay up a universal and then tax the excess. Yeah. Why they pay children? We don't need more children in an overpopulated world. No, I, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. This is the, the short answer. Thank you. And finally. Um, my name is Nigel White. I, after 30 odd years of working, decided last year to start um, in, enjoying myself by doing different things. Amongst one of which is becoming a pension scheme trustee. Um, my question uh, is, given the sort of move you outlined at the, at the start, the changing nature of pensions, moving from traditional defined benefit schemes increasingly to um, defined contribution and the policy change in that area, do you think that is, I mean, the way I see it is very much still being in flux and do you see sort of further shocks and changes to come? I suspect you, you will get, we will be getting sort of further so-called pension crises occurring when at particular points of the economic cycle people wishing to get annuities find that uh, their defined contribution schemes have not produced what they were expecting. And I still haven't really thought it through, but do you think that the market will develop innovative solutions to try and overcome some of these problems for particular particular cohorts? I think, I think the solution comes down to a very, very simple thing, which is an adequate funding level. At the moment, right now, today, the combined employer and employee average contribution to a DC scheme is 9.2%. This is totally inadequate. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, but even with adequate funding, you, you can find that uh, a particular group of people who happen to be turning their pot into an annuity at a particular point in time just hit the wrong time. Yep. Yeah. I, I think I honestly agree that there is a problem coming uh, with great disappointment for pensioners if they um, cash out of their pension at the wrong time in the investment cycle and if they buy their annuity at a low point in the annuity rate cycle. And uh, yes, I couldn't agree more. There is a problem coming. Do you see a solution to this question? Um, the, the simple solution, is that we, the single most important thing we could do is get that contribution rate up to somewhere near Australia's. 15% per annum, you stand a fighting chance of getting a good um, outcome in retirement. 9.2%, you don't stand a prayer. Yeah, there are various ways of going at this, but the very simple one is um, if you put in 15% of your gross salary year in, year out throughout your working life, you will prob probably um, get a 50% or better replacement rate of your income in retirement. Touch wood, nothing guaranteed, but you've got to be doing that. Thank you very much for listening and I'll draw things to a close now. Thank you all very much for being here.